Did you know that November became recognized as Native American Heritage Month on the federal level in 1990? Welcome to the Lore of the South. Lore of the South. Welcome back to Lore of the South with me, Kelly Cruz. How the heck are y'all doing? We have entered the holiday season, y'all. Ready or not, it's here. My mom is already planning out all the decorations. She is going gnome crazy, which y'all really is fine by me. I love the little guy and girl gnomes. Do y'all remember David the gnome? I'm sure I've talked about this before. But it was a favorite of mine growing up. I related to those little short round people <laughs> that loved animals and nature. Um, there was this book. It was kind of like a gnome encyclopedia. It had everything from like how they lived, what they lived in, all this kind of stuff. And if I ever see that book again, I'm getting it. Like, I swear I had it when I was little, but no idea what happened to it. But anyway, so back to decorating. Um, do y'all go all out for the holidays? Do you even celebrate the holidays? <laughs> Are you talking out loud to this podcast right now? What else? Um, y'all, I finally went to the eye doctor and my distance vision is still amazing. My near vision is crap. So I was officially welcomed into my mid-40s with my first pair of progressive lenses. But y'all, I can see without having to hold everything at arm's length. I could even read teeny tiny print. Seeing as how well I can read and see now, I thought we might dig up some history making news. Our story this week comes from science.org. On the banks of the Tolanese River in northern Germany, the remains of thousands of warriors were found dating from about 3,000 years ago. These burials make up the largest prehistoric battle ever discovered. Genetic testing was done on 14 of the skeletons, two of which being female. These discoveries proving that women fought alongside the men. The DNA sequencing also showed that these warriors had all been from Germany, Poland, and the Czech Republic. They also had another thing in common. Every last one of them was lactose intolerant, which just might push the date forward for when adult humans would have been able to digest cow's milk. Now on to today's episode. And y'all, I'm sneaking this one in at the very end of November. So y'all, I apologize, but like I think I said in the last episode a few weeks ago, November is the craziest month of the year for us. I have been sitting on show suggestions from Elle for months. I even started writing the episode, but it seemed like every time I sat down to work on it, I'd get some sort of bad news. So I'm taking the hint from the universe. And once again, I'm shelving Elle's suggestion for later. I do apologize, Elle, but girl, my brain can't handle that level of heavy right now. But your suggestion will be shared and people should know about these places. I will do it when I can just wrap my brain around it and not run away from my laptop. But how about some Native American myths and legends for this Thanksgiving season? Y'all just pretend it's still Thanksgiving. So welcome to episode 76, Native American Myths and Legends. Our first peoples, like people all over, created these stories to explain their environment around them and how they fit into it. Like Prometheus stole fire from the Greek gods for man. While in one Native American legend, it was a fast and brave rabbit that stole fire from a band of evil weasels to give to the humans. So y'all sit back, plug your earbuds into your ears, and hear a few Native American legends in honor of Native American History Month. Starting off with 
starting with the Creek Nation. Their territory stretched through Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina, and were known as the Muskogee people. They were also known as the Great Mound Builders. Our first story is, in fact, how the rabbit stole fire. In the beginning, there was no fire, and the earth was cold. Then the Thunderbirds sent their lightning to the sycamore tree on an island where the weasels lived. The weasels were the only ones that had fire, and they would not give any of it away. The people knew that there was fire on the island because they could see the smoke coming from the sycamore. But the water was too deep for anyone to cross. When winter came, the people suffered so much from the cold that they called a council to find some way of obtaining fire from the weasels. They invited all of the animals who could swim. How shall we obtain fire? The people asked. Most of the animals were afraid of the weasels because they were bloodthirsty and they ate mice and moles and fish and birds. Rabbit was the only one who was brave enough to try to steal fire from them. I can run and swim faster than the weasels, he said. I am also a good dancer. Every night the weasels build a big fire and dance around it. Tonight I will swim across and join in the dancing. And then I will run away with some fire. He considered the matter for a while and then decided how he should do it. Before the sun set, he rubbed his head with pine tar so that it would make his hair stand up. Then as darkness was falling, he swam across to the island. The weasels received Rabbit gladly because they had heard of his fame as a dancer. Soon they had a big fire blazing and all began dancing around it. As the weasels danced, they approached nearer and nearer the fire in the center of the circle. They would bow to the fire and then dance backwards away from it. When Rabbit entered the dancing circle, the weasel shouted to him, Lead us, Rabbit! And he danced ahead of them, coming closer and closer to the fire. He bowed to the fire, bringing his head lower and lower as if he were going to take hold of it. While the weasels were dancing faster and faster, trying to keep up with him, Rabbit suddenly bowed very low so that the pine tar in his hair caught fire in a flash of flame. He ran off with his head ablaze, and the angry weasels pursued him, crying, Catch him! Catch him! He has stolen our sacred fire! Catch him and throw him down! But Rabbit outran them, plunged into the water, leaving the weasels on shore. He swam across the water with flames still blazing from his hair. The weasels now called on the Thunderbirds to make it rain, so as to extinguish the fire stolen by Rabbit. For three days, rain poured down on the earth, and the weasels were sure that no fire was left burning, except for in their sycamore tree. Rabbit, however, had built a fire in the hollow of a tree, and when the rain stopped and the sun shone, he came out and gave fire to all of the people. After that, Whenever it rained, they kept fires in their shelters, and that's how Rabbit brought fire to the people. All right, next we have another Muskogee tale about the bat. The birds challenged the four-legged footed animals to play them in a game of ball. Each group agreed that all creatures that had teeth should play on one side, and all of those that had feathers should play on the other. They chose a suitable day, cleared a playing field, erected poles, and obtained balls from the medicine men. When the players gathered, all that had teeth went on one side, and those who had feathers went on the other. When the bat came, he joined the animals that had teeth. No! said the animals to the bat. You have wings. You must play with the birds. Bat went over to the side with the birds, but they said, No, you have teeth. You must play with the animals. They drove him away, saying, You are so small. You could do us no good anyway. 
And so the bat went back to the animals, begging them to let him play with them. At last they agreed. You are too small to help us, but as you have teeth, we will let you remain on our side. The game began, and the birds quickly took the lead because they could catch the ball in the air, where the four-footed animals could not reach it. The crane was the best player, and he caught the ball so often that it looked as if the birds were going to win the game. As none of the animals could fly, they were in despair. The little bat now entered the game, flying into the air and catching the ball, while the crane was flapping slowly along. Again and again, Bat caught the ball, and he won the game for the four-footed animals. And they agreed that even though the Bat was very small and had wings, he should always be classed with the animals having teeth. Let's see, next, how about something from the Natchez people that come from along the Mississippi near modern-day Natchez, Mississippi? They were also a part of the Mound Building Society, and the Natchez followed the type of matrilineal nobility. The chief would pass from the mother's line and not his father's. It also appears that the Natchez had a class system, which is considered rare amongst North American natives. How the day was divided. The animals held a meeting, and then Nokosi, the bear, presided. The question was how to divide the day and the night. Some desired the day to last all the time, and others wished it to be always night. After much talk, the ground squirrels said, I see the raccoon has rings on his tail, divided equally, first dark color, then light color. I think the day and night ought to be divided like the rings of the raccoon's tail. The animals were surprised by the wisdom of the ground squirrel and adopted his plan and divided the day and night like the rings on the raccoon's tail, succeeding each other on a regular order bear from envy scratched the back of the squirrel and this caused the stripes on the back of all of his descendants of the ground squirrels so y'all not only do we know how day and night was divided we also know how a ground squirrel or chipmunk got the stripes down his back look at that it's a two for one So now we have a story of creation from the Florida Seminoles. Ever so long ago, the breath maker blew his breath toward the sky and created the Milky Way. This broad path in the night sky leads to the city of the West. There is where souls of the good Indians go when they die. Bad Indian souls stay in the ground where they were buried. When the Seminole Indians walk through the woods and step where a bad person has been buried, they become fearful. Even though the grave is covered with brush, they always seem to know that a bad person is buried there. The Seminoles say the Milky Way shines brightest following the death of one of their tribe. They believe this is so that the path to the city in the sky will be lighted brightly for the traveling Seminole. For a good Indian to be able to walk over the Milky Way, he must first be one whom everyone likes. He cannot be one who talks in an evil manner or lies and steals. He must be brave at all times and an honor to the Seminoles. For the Seminoles, the spirit way or the milky way for human souls. And then there's also a dog way. And in the sky path for souls of dogs and other animals that die, spirits never return to earth from the city in the sky. Seminoles do not believe that ghostly visitors ever come back and visit their people again. Along the Milky Way lives rain and rainbow. The Seminole word for rainbow means to stop the rain. 
and that is what the rainbow does when it appears. When the sun is eclipsed, the Seminoles say that the toad frog has come along and taken a bite from the sun. Toad frog continues eating at the sun until the sun disappears. Seminole hunters shoot arrows at toad frogs whenever they see one, preventing eclipses of the sun or the moon. Seminole hunters like to, to make loud clamor to scare away the toad frogs before they appear. Along the Milky Way is the Big Dipper, which seems like a boat to the Seminoles. They say it is used to carry the souls of the good Seminoles along the Milky Way to the city in the sky. The Seminole tribe calls the morning star the tomorrow star, and the evening star is known to them as the red star. This one is from the Tuskegee. I believe they're from Alabama since there's a Tuskegee, Alabama. Okay, let's see. Origins of the Earth. Before the beginning, water was everywhere, but no people, animals, or earth were visible. There were birds, however, who held counsel to decide if it might be best to have all land or all water. Let us have land so we can have more food, said one of the birds. Others said, let us have all water, because we like it this way. Subsequently, they appointed Eagle as their chief. Who was to decide one way or the other? Eagle decided upon land, and asked, who will go search for land? Dove volunteered first, and flew away. In four days, he completed his hunt and returned reporting, I could not find land anywhere. Crawfish came swimming along and asked by the council, to help search for land. He disappeared under the water for four days. When he arose to the surface again, he held up some dirt in his claws. He said he found some land deep in the water. Crawfish made a ball of the dirt and handed it to Chief Eagle, who then flew away with it. Four days later, he returned and said to the council, Now there is land, an island. Follow me. The whole bird colony flew after Eagle to see the new land, though it was a very small island. Gradually, the land began to grow larger and larger as the water became lower and lower. More islands appear, and these grew together, creating larger islands into one Earth. The Tuskegee people say they were chosen by the Great Spirit to be the first people to live upon the new Earth. A long, long time ago. Okay, y'all, one more. And this one comes from both the Choctaw and the Chickasaw. Story of origin. So we've got a few of these origin stories here. The Choctaw who remain in the Mississippi tell this story as an explanation of how they came to the land where they live now and of how Nanaiawea Mound came to be. Two brothers, Choctaw and Chickasaw, led the original people from the land in the far west that had ceased to prosper. The people traveled for a long time, guided by a magical pole. Each night, when the people stopped to camp, the pole was placed in the ground, and in the morning, the people would travel in the direction in which the pole leaned. After traveling for an extremely long time, they finally came to a place where the pole remained upright. In this place, they laid to rest the bones of their ancestors, which they had carried in buffalo sacks from the original land in the west. The mound grew out of that great burial. After the burial brothers discovered that the land could not support all the people, the Chickasaw took half the people and departed to the north and eventually became the Chickasaw tribe. Choctaw and the others remained near the mound and are now known as the Choctaw. The elders of the tribe claim to this day that the ground near the mound and the caves are sacred and that they will fall ill and die if they are ever away from that land too long. Well, y'all, thank y'all for hanging in there with us for this month of November. Y'all, I can't say it enough. Novembers are always even busier than Christmas time around here. But y'all, I have show notes, of course. There are so many similarities to the biblical flood. 
um, from Hebrews Exodus to even the creation itself, the dividing of day and night, the world would be such a better place if we could just see all of our similarities instead of our differences. Thousands of people all over this planet tell the same stories. The languages and the characters change, but the stories unite us. Now finally, back to our oldest buildings by state. It's been a minute, y'all, and I hope I can remember where we are. <laughs> Let's see, I had to go back a few episodes <laughs> to remind myself. As always, our oldest buildings by state come to us from the Discoverer blog. And this week we have Oklahoma and Oregon. So up first, in Oklahoma, we have Fort Gibson, which was built as a garrison in 1824. But the oldest surviving building dates from the 1840s. And it is soon to be the old barracks. Now in Oregon, it's a log house that sits at the foot of the Cascade Mountains. The log cabin was built back in the 1790s by Canadian fur trappers. The cabin is now being moved log by log to the Hopkins Demonstration Forest. Thank you all for joining us and hanging in there and waiting for a November episode. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask producer Mike to release one of his favorite Patreon episodes for a free preview as an early Christmas present. Also, I'm sending out some goodie bags to our Patreon supporters and had an idea to do a drawing. Leave us a five-star written review and I'll do a drawing of all the reviews that have been left and then we can announce the winner on the Christmas episode. And you too will get a little lot surprise pack. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Laura the South with me, Kelly Cruz. Follow us on social media for show updates. And I also post pics to go along with each episode. You can email the show at loreofthesouth at gmail.com. If you care to check out the Patreon, only $3 a month. Search for The Lore of the South on Patreon.com. And with that, we'll talk to y'all later on the next Lore of the South. Stay tuned for a preview of our latest Patreon episode. Back in September, um, a small town in Portugal had wine vats explode and 581,000 gallons Ooh. of wine flooded the streets of this town. Oh, wow. Just recently. Yes. Yeah. This wow. just happened last month. And I mean, like, it's pretty hilly town. Yeah. So it was like yeah. seriously like rivers of wine flowing down these Isn't like old ancient streets yeah. in Portugal. Remember the story that happened in England with a beer, the beer brewery? Yeah. Like, no one was hurt with this, though. But like right. there was like some people killed in the beer yeah. um, explosion. <laughs> Speaking of speaking of the old lady who uh, went out the way she go. wanted to, yeah. <laughs> Death by a beer vat. Yeah, but apparently there's a huge um what's it called when you have like a huge harvest of something? Like there's an overabundance, let's just put it yeah. that way. Surplus. There's a surplus of wine apparently right now. Oh, okay. And so I guess this wine place, their storage facilities just kind of backed up. Yeah, it was too much. Yeah. And, the, and the tanks went. Yeah. So, but that's all. I mean, yeah. I'll have to post a YouTube video because, like, yeah. I'm serious. Like, I don't know why they weren't all out in the streets, like, gathering it. If you loved what you heard, check out the Patreon page for exclusive content by searching for The Lore of the South on Patreon.com.